Forum for China-Africa Cooperation wraps up. China and Africa collaborate on everything from health to infrastructure. But can the West understand this mutually beneficial relationship and does it matter? And unforeseen consequences of climate change include conflict and migration. We speak to the ICRC to see what can be done to help the most vulnerable. I'm Li Xin and welcome to The Point, an opinion show coming to you from Beijing. China winning hearts and minds in Africa while naysayers in the West smear China-Africa cooperation as predatory or worse, neocolonialization. The just uh, wrapped up 8th Ministerial Conference of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, or FOCAC, highlights deep ties between the two sides. According to an independent African poster released earlier this month, 63% of Africans view China's influence on the continent positively during 2019 to 2021. What's solidifying China's image in Africa? How has cooperation between China and African countries benefited both sides? Have African countries borrowed too much from China? Joining me today for the discussion from Beijing is uh, Zhang Yongpeng, Senior Research Fellow from the Institute of West Asian and African Studies at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and from Johannesburg, South Africa, David Monyaye, Director of the Center for Africa-China Studies at the University of Johannesburg. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point. So, as I said, many Western reports describe China's African policies and activities as predatory. However, the result of a survey carried out in 34 African countries from 2019 to 2021 released recently by Afrobarometer, an influential African poster, found that 63% of Africans viewed China's economic and political influence on the continent positively. That's higher than the United States and some in other countries, even higher than that of uh, the United Nations or the African Union. So, Dr. Monyaye, how do you look at this contrast? On the one hand, what's depicted of China on the international, especially Western press, and what African people think of China's influence. How has China been able to win African minds and hearts despite such media reports? The very first thing that uh, has to be said is that China's history uh, on the continent is deeply entrenched uh, in the political, during the liberation struggle, uh, going as back as uh, Bangdang in 1965, uh, China and Asian, uh, um, China within uh, Asia, uh, with African countries, I think they set clear targets in terms of how to deal with the inequality at the global level, to deal with imperialism, colonialism, also to deal with the lack of technology transfer from the Western world. So uh, up to now, China has grown to become the second largest economy. And we have seen a country that has been um, working with Africans from the West Gulf, uh, with changing with each decade. Uh, during Mao, I think it was uh, China helping African countries in the liberation, training them, arming them. Um, and it played a great deal uh, in liberating the African continent, as well as sacrifices that China made uh, in the building of the Tazara and going beyond that. Um, as with the opening up in 1978 in China, we've seen the growth of Chinese economy with the increased uh, trade relationship with Africa. And therefore, this is a relationship that the Western world cannot stop, um, cannot blackmail, um, and uh, uh, they keep on uh, using terms that do not apply on China, such as neocolonialism. China has never colonized any inch of the African continent, while the West have been the imperialist and colonialist uh, mm. on, the, on our country. Mm. Mr. Zhang, did the result of the surveys come as a surprise for the Chinese people or Chinese authorities? Uh, yeah, uh, China-Africa uh, relations has uh, rooted uh, in the root classes uh, on the, and could date it back to uh, decades of years. And uh, the, the friendship, uh, China-Africa friendship has been forced, uh, formed in the 1960s and the 70s, and uh, and we share the similar history and share the uh, similar goal of uh, development. And all of these 
and uh, supporting politically in the 1960s and the 70s and up to uh, the, the new century, 21st century, Chinese investment and the loans and uh, economic support to Africa and politically the support from the African side to the Chinese uh, sovereignty and also put together accumulated the solid foundation for the uh, bilateral rela relations and since the establishment of the FOCAC in 20, uh, 2000, uh, China-Africa uh, relationship has entered a all-inclusive uh, stage of uh, development. So the results of these surveys uh, do not come as a surprise to the Chinese side. Um, Chinese yeah. President Xi Jinping said during his virtual address on the opening ceremony of the conference, uh, the latest uh, FOCA conference, that the key to China-Africa deep bond lies in the China-Africa friendship and cooperation spirit. And he specifically said um, the spirit is sincere friendship and equality, win-win for mutual benefit and common development, fairness and justice, and progress with the times, and openness and inclusiveness. Mr. Zhang, let me stay with you. This is the first time that concrete words are given to describe the China-Africa relationship. Why did President Xi use these words to open his address? How important is the, the, the description of the spirit? Yes, uh, I think this is the actually or we should say initially this has been the nature of the China-Africa cooperation and the relationship and because uh, as I mentioned just now uh, China-Africa relation has been based on the uh, a solid supporting with each other political or e economically and nowadays we have right we have to make a conclusion it is just uh, look forward to the coming new stage new era in such a new era and uh, we are facing uh, lots of the uh, opportunities and as well as some of the challenges and for example the COVID-19 and for example the counter globalization tendency and the facing when facing with all of these issues and uh, especially opportunities and uh, that could be found in the bilateral uh, corporations China Africa should start very fresh stage new stage that try to develop some new uh, programs and new projects and especially uh, considering the uh, re re realization of the uh, Chinese uh, dream and the African dream and to realize the, the goal of uh, uh, weather 2063 from the African Union mm -hmm. or in the middle of the, this century the Chinese, Chinese goals and Chinese dream. Okay. And so, yeah. yeah, together with this, under yeah. the better road, we mm -hmm. can push Mr. forward. Yeah, let me get the feedback from Mr. Monyae. Uh, does that spirit, you know, clearly worded, clearly stipulated in President Xi's words, does that spirit resonate with African people? Do African people also see this as the, as the key to why China and African countries enjoy such a good relationship? Indeed. I think uh, President Xi Jinping uh, managed to really uh, put China aside from the Western world. Um, China was not involved in slavery. China never colonized the continent. China never used multilateral institutions to impose uh, stringent economic policies on the African continent. And China plays a fair game when it comes to health issues, as well as um, assisting Africans in terms of education and all other areas. So I think uh, from a language perspective, the narrative, uh, it was quite clear uh, and it's something that really resonates with most Africans mm. uh, on the ground. Mm. According to the Afrobarometer finding, however, out of the 47% of interviewees who are aware of China's loans and development assistance to their country, 57% think their government has borrowed too much from China. Um, I want to ask Mr. Zhang, uh, because according to China's latest white paper on China-Africa cooperation, it seems to be a different picture. For instance, almost half of China's foreign aid goes to uh, African countries and uh, in, in various forms, such as grants, such as interest-free loans or concessional loans. And uh, China has done a lot and canceled, actually, a lot of outstanding debts of African countries, 15 of them. So is there, Mr. Zhang, a, a misperception between what 
is really the case and what is thought to be the case in terms of China's financial aid and financial assistance to African countries? Yeah, uh, and maybe uh, I think uh, all of these uh, uh, disputes or, or uh, right, the words, negative words uh, produced by some uh, media, and especially from the Western media, and even in the African countries, a uh, lot of the uh, journalists and uh, some of the uh, government officials and uh, some of the civilians, they are not so clear of the, uh, the nature of all of these uh, loans, uh, the, the money that borrowed from China uh, by the African countries. But actually, because uh, they are deeply infected by the Western media and the Chinese Western media are weak in uh, African countries. But the nature of all of these uh, loans not completely a some kind of a uh, crisis it is uh, uh right and uh no not absolutely uh should be called some uh, uh, debt crisis or debt distress uh, actually china's loans and uh, uh, affection to the african debt could be uh less than 20 percent and according to the research of the uh johannes uh, Hop uh, hopkins university uh, John Hopkins University, and uh, at least, at most, 20% uh, uh, are from uh, China. And uh, the other, the majority of this, uh, that is to say 80% are from the other multilateral institutions I see. I see. and the private institutions. Yeah. And uh, so... Yeah. Dr. Munai, uh, time is very limited. Let me get your perspective on the same issue. I think we have to look at the history of loans, particularly infrastructure loans. What is being said at the moment, it's a historical. If you look at the loans that Western um, European country uh, um, uh, borrowed uh, money during uh, in the post-Second World War, uh, it took time for those loans to be paid. Um, and it's the role of the state to ensure that you develop infrastructure. And with time, I think you see uh, the easiness and productivity of this uh, infrastructure in terms of the economy. Uh, and I don't know why Africa is being judged differently. Um, uh, infrastructure loans, by their very nature, takes time. And the second most important thing is that um, the global economy is not doing well. Since the uh, 2008 global financial crisis, compounded by the COVID uh, crisis, and there's absolutely no doubt that most African countries do not have res adequate resource to eat. Not all. And Africa has 55 countries. Mm. So um, it is also problematic to use the word Africa. I mean, they vary in terms of right. their ability to uh, uh, borrow. And therefore, we have to do more studies. Uh, there's no such thing as debt trap. Um, other than um, forcing China as well as African countries to fall within OECD rules, which comes with conditions which are stringent. They, these conditions have damaged the African continent. Most of the crisis we face, particularly in health, it has to do with economic structural adjustment that took place in 1980s. Up to now, most African countries have never recovered from that crisis. China released the white paper, as I said, last Friday that sums up concrete results from China-African countries. And uh, I just want to highlight some numbers, for instance, uh, that uh, uh, China is Africa's number one trading partner since 2009. It's the second largest destination for Africa's agricultural exports, and China is buying more non-resource products from Africa. China gives zero tariff treatment to 97% of taxable items from 33 least developed countries, and China's imports and services from Africa have gone up by 20% on average annually since 2017. Mr. Zhang, what do these numbers tell us about you know, the reciprocity about what China is doing with Africa. Is it a one-way street? Uh, yes, uh, I, I think the, uh, this is a, a good example of uh, complementarity, uh, and especially the economic complementarity between China and Africa. And we know that uh, Africa has the advantage of resources, and China has the advantage of uh, 
industry and manufacturing and these two could combine together and make some uh, production force and uh, at the same time we know that uh, there had been some uh, projects that is called resource for project and this is very successful cooperation and it is on uh, by doing so and the Chi uh, the african countries infrastructure building has been largely improved okay the, we have the to leave it there yeah, yeah mr Zhang, time is very limited so sorry for interrupting thank you so much to Zhang Yongping, Zhang Yongpeng from china and, da and dr david munai joining us from uh, johannesburg south africa we, we are going to take a short break and when we come back some of the countries with the smallest carbon footprints are also the hardest hit by climate change. I speak to the ICRC to see how we can stave off an impending humanitarian crisis. Stay with us. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. Climate change fallouts are engulfing people who haven't received sufficient attention and assistance. The International Committee of the Red Cross, or ICRC, says countries least responsible to the climate crisis are getting hardest hit. Many are suffering double damage with extreme weather disasters as well as armed conflict such as Afghanistan. What strategies can the ICRC adopt to hold off this looming humanitarian crisis? Will the world come together to help? Earlier, I spoke with Pierre Crayenbuhl, personal envoy of the ICRC president to China and also head of the ICRC East Asia delegation. Here's what he said. <laughs> Mr. Krembühl, today's climate and environmental crisis threatens the survival of humanity. That's the first sentence written in the Climate and Environmental Charter for Humanitarian Organizations, which is released by the ICRC. And the charter had already been signed by 160 organizations before the start of COP26 to urge world leaders into action. What's the charter all about and why the urgency? Well, first of all, I think we have to realize that we are all, each and every one of us, at risk because of the effects of climate change. Now, what we have observed is, of course, that not everyone is at risk in the same way. Not everyone is equally at risk. And what the Charter highlights is that very often people who have the least contributed to climate change are the ones that are the hardest hit. And in ICRC terms, what we observe is that people who are already affected in situations of armed conflict are made doubly vulnerable by the effects of climate change. And I think this is a dimension that is often overlooked and underestimated and that needs a lot more attention. Some people are pointing out that we need to pivot from war aid to climate aid. According to an article published on the ICRC supporting organization Climate Center, only 6% out of a total of uh, 30 billion US dollars in humanitarian assistance was allocated to climate aid in 2020. Uh, do you agree that this was a fair amount to be devoted to climate aid? Look, again, I think what is very important to see is that many countries that are affected by armed conflict are also among those that are the hardest hit by the effects of climate change. So two things really need to happen. On the side of humanitarian organizations, we need to improve the way that we support populations to be able to cope with this double effect. So that's for humanitarian organizations such as ours to change the way in which we work and respond to protect communities, strengthen their resilience, help them to cope with the double dimension. But what we realize also is that there is a disparity in the way in which climate financing 
is distributed. Mm. The majority, about 70% of all climate financing currently goes to middle income countries and not to least developed countries, which are those that are often also the least well prepared to cope with the dual effects of climate change and conflict. And this despite commitments that were made in the context of the Paris Agreement. So here we need a change of mindset because if donors and institutions that are supposed to support climate financing hesitate to invest in countries that are conflict affected, then we are in a vicious circle uh, and especially very negative for the populations concerned. Most of the countries vulnerable to climate change are also affected by conflicts. That's uh, what you said, and also that's according to an ICRC report published last year. So how exactly are these two factors amplifying humanitarian crises? Are vulnerable populations getting the attention and the resources they deserve and need? Uh, just now you said a uh, greater amount of resources actually go to middle-income countries. Why? Well, first of all, you're to answer your question very directly, do these populations get what they need? The answer is clearly no. And uh, think of the work that was prepared also in the run-up to COP26 in Glasgow. It indicates among the 25 countries that are most uh, at risk and, and least prepared to cope with the effects of climate change, 14 of them are caught up, engulfed, and mired in armed conflicts. So it's very clear that the impact of climate change amplifies and exacerbates uh, the suffering of people in the south of Iraq, where water scarcity and conflict impact the choices that communities have to make to survive. And these interconnections, again, need to be better understood, and we need to highlight them more actively in the international setting. Afghanistan is a case in point. It's suffering from food shortages and displacement, exacerbated by the harsh winter, together with uh, constant threats of terrorism. What has the ICRC been able to do so far? How do you know it's reaching the people in need? So first of all, Afghanistan is a country where I have worked myself. I have visited numerous times. It's a country that is close to anyone's heart who has worked in the ICRC. It is a country and these are people who have suffered decades of, of war. In many ways, it's a country on its knees in terms of the ability to cope with more shocks. And indeed, at present, the, the data that is available is that about 47% of the Afghan population faces food insecurity in one form or another. Mm. Now, the winter is coming, but I think what has to be understood in particular is that the financial support, the aid, but also financial flows into Afghanistan have essentially currently dried up. And th therefore, institutions that crucially provide for the needs of uh, the people are currently facing incredibly dire circumstances. So what ICRC is doing, for example, in central and southern regions of Afghanistan, we are supporting farmers in their choices with cash so that they can uh, either direct that cash to uh, food needs, uh, education needs of their children, but also medical uh, supplies and needs that they uh, may require. These are adjustments that we make to our operating modalities in order to serve the people as best we can. What exactly is uh, standing in the way and how big is the funding gap for Afghanistan and how are countries reacting to the call for funding? So we have, and our colleagues in Afghanistan, have carried out uh, a range of assessments to see what are currently the most critical needs in this new phase and where can we as ICRC make the biggest difference, uh, cooperating with our colleagues in the Afghan Red Crescent Society and other actors in the country. And where we see some of the greatest needs is in the area of health. ICRC has historically uh, invested a great amount of energy and efforts in the sector of health, uh, supporting hospitals, clinics, and health centers. And exactly because of what I highlighted earlier, the interruption of financial flows into the country, this sector is very much at risk. So we are supporting and engaging there uh, very actively. And this is an area of priority that we will uh, certainly focus on greatly. We need about 150 million Swiss francs or 160 million US dollars until the end of 2022. 
we will mobilize support from states. And in that regard, uh, we are approaching uh, China, and uh, this is a priority for us. We welcome the fact that uh, our partners in the Red Cross Society of China have come forward with a first financial support, which we are very grateful for. And we are now continuing the dialogue also with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We, we hope that there are avenues of cooperation that can open up. Exactly. Since you are, you are here in China, uh, what else can you tell us about what you have been able to do, what you have been able to achieve in collaboration with Chinese authorities in providing humanitarian assistance in general? So we have, first of all, learned a great deal from Chinese perspectives, and we think we have also brought the ICRC's experience to many of the conversations that we've had over recent years, but also in particular in recent months with the changes that have occurred in Afghanistan. I'm very grateful for the dialogue and the quality of that dialogue with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Red Cross Society of China. Mm -hmm. There is one area of focus that we have, which is, as I said, the health sector in Afghanistan. China built the Mirwais Hospital, which is in Kandahar and is still today known as the, the Chinese hospital. Uh, China has also built a hospital in Kabul, and there are among the efforts that the ICRC is investing now in supporting, strengthening the capacity of hospitals throughout the country, uh, a possibility for us to cooperate in that regard, and we would be very interested to build that cooperation and to seize the opportunity of responding to the needs of Afghan people together uh, with China in that regard. Good to hear that, and I do hope that these efforts will come to fruition as soon as possible. Finally, world leaders have convened many times during the second half of this year discussing climate change cooperation and solutions for regional turmoil. What do you assess, how do you assess the current atmosphere of international cooperation on these subjects? What's needed to turn momentum into a greater concrete action? You know, I think we can be honest about the fact that there is insufficient uh, cooperation at a multilateral level. Uh, I think when we look at issues like climate, when we look at issues such as the response to the COVID pandemic, but frankly speaking, also in the areas in which ICRC works uh, in relation to armed conflict, conflict resolution, we find that there is insufficient uh, collaboration at a global level. I would call it a, a deficit of collaboration, mm -hmm. probably still in many ways a deficit of trust, and certainly also a deficit in the ability to bring peace to many regions of this planet. And I think it would need there a new mobilization, and we would call uh, for that, of building trustful relations among states, because at the end of the day, it is the fate of humanity that is at stake when you think of the combination of climate, of COVID, and of conflict, really, when you look at all those issues together, there is no way to address and resolve these issues. We can have the same conversations in 10 or 20 years, and we will see the same needs. So also, when you work in a humanitarian organization like the ICRC, and you have people in front of you every single day, our colleagues around the world, having to face the injustice, the suffering, and the pain uh, that these communities go through, we really would call for an upsurge in cooperation and in trust building uh, to find the necessary answers to all these challenges.